Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience. We're having a couple of technical difficulties this morning. Um, we're hoping that Sam Berger uh, from OIR will be, will be able to join us shortly. Um, sorry, I'm just coordinating some things on the back end. Um, but welcome to the event this morning on um, the time tax, better access to benefits by reducing administrative burden. Um, burdens such as excessive paperwork, difficult re-enrollment procedures, and complicated applications can prevent otherwise eligible people from obtaining the benefits that they need. These types of benefits can be particularly challenging um, to those of uh, from underserved communities. States, practitioners, and the federal government have all turned their attention to the complex systems and what we're calling this morning the time tax um, that individuals families, and even small businesses navigate as they try to access the programs and services that can grow the middle class. Um, we're really excited today to have wonderful panelists, um, as well as hopefully um, uh, folks from um, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs and the White House Office of Management and Budget, um, to talk about attention to this important issue um, that really stretches across the social safety net and all sorts of programs and services that the federal government and state governments administer. Um, so I'm uh, Lily Roberts. I'm the Managing Director of the Inclusive Growth Department here at the Center for American Progress, um, and I'm very excited to welcome our panel. Um, you may hear me sort of popping in at various points to try to see if we've gotten um, Sam Berger from uh, OIRA, um, but otherwise, I will introduce our panel and get started. Um, so just give me one second to see if there's a new way that we can access uh, Sam's audio line. Okay, um, I will give two seconds to see if that worked. Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so we're gonna go ahead this morning. I wanna make two brief housekeeping notes. Um, we do have closed captions available. So I encourage you to press the button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to use that closed captioning. Um, in addition, we will have time for audience submitted question and answer at the end of our hour together. So please do use the chat function to submit those questions. Uh, we will get to as many as we can. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce our three panelists this morning. They're incredible experts and thinkers in the reality of policy. So once you've gone from the idea of a policy, how is it administered across a really wide range of issues? Um, I will introduce the three of them and then we will get right to questions. Um, Dr. Carolyn Barnes completed her PhD in political science and public policy at the University of Michigan. Uh, she's a visiting scholar um, with the Russell Sage Foundation and a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, her book, State of Empowerment, Low Low Income Families and the New Welfare State um, was published in March of 2020, and it uses ethnographic accounts of three organizations to reveal how interacting with government funded after school programs can enhance the civic and political lives of low income citizens. Michelle Evermore um, is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation, uh, where she focuses on policy for improving the nation's social insurance, insurance programs. She's one of the country's leading experts on unemployment insurance. Um, Michelle most recently served as deputy director for policy in the newly formed Office of Unemployment Insurance Modernization in the U.S. Department of Labor. In that role, she spearheaded efforts to improve the delivery of UI benefits in a timely and accurate manner and ensure equitable access for underserved communities. Um, Cindy Long is the administrator of USDA Food and Nutrition Services, known as FNS. Um, administrator Long previously served as the deputy administrator for FNS child nutrition programs. Um, she was responsible for all aspects of federal administration of the child nutrition programs, including national school lunch, um, school breakfast program, child and adult care food program, summer food service program, and the fresh fruit and vegetable program. In this role, she has led FNS's implementation of the most significant restructuring of these programs in a decade. And I see that we might have Sam. Can Sam speak or hear? Still no, okay, that's fine. Um, so if Sam had been able to give his opening remarks, he would have been discussing how OIRA um, and the federal government is uh, thinking expansively about the idea of administrative. Oh, wait. Lily, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Oh, thank you. 
Okay. Wow. So we've I'm over so we've overcome the administrative burden of uh, separate audio and video logins. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my sincere apologies for uh, having some some troubles on that end. Um, but uh, I think if it's okay, maybe I'll I'll say a few words before we turn over to the panel. Does that work? That would be that would be great. Go ahead. <laughs> well, first, just wanted to, to start by thanking the Center for American Progress for putting this together, uh, for inviting me to attend, for pulling together this fabulous panel uh, that we're going to learn a tremendous amount from. So just really excited uh, to be here and uh, talking about reducing administrative burdens for people accessing government benefits and services. Um, it might be helpful just to start at the beginning. You know, when we talk about administrative burdens, we mean the time and effort necessary for people to take steps like wading through complicated eligibility requirements filling out confusing paperwork, assembling required documents, or visiting government offices. These act as a kind of time tax that millions of individuals, families, and small businesses pay every year. And these burdens have real consequences. One individual described the process of recertifying eligibility for disability benefits as more frightening than having cancer twice. For some, the burdens prevent access to much needed benefits. Uh, others may succeed in accessing the benefits, but they pay a heavy cost through lost time, additional stress, stigma, and more. And these inefficient processes and duplicative information requests staff Americans trust in the ability of government to operate efficiently and fairly to get results. That's why the office that I'm the associate administrator of, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, is working to fix this. In 2022, we launched an initiative to do two things. One, more accurately estimate the burdens faced by the public when attempting to access public benefits and services, and two, to reduce that burden. And this first step is really important because in some cases, agencies just don't fully understand the extent of the burdens they're placing on people. They work with these forms and processes every day, which can make it harder to see the issues they pose for people encountering them for the first time. Once these burdens are properly measured and accounted for, it's easier to think through the steps we need to take to reduce them. Reducing burdens to assets and public benefits and services is, is not just an wire thing. It's a central priority for the Biden-Harris administration. It's reflected in the administration's focus on improving customer experience and on our work in advancing equity. As part of this broader effort, we at Awire have a unique responsibility under the law for ensuring that agency forms, which is one of the government's most common touch points with the public, are minimally burdensome. Under the Paperwork Reduction Act, Awire is statutorily responsible for minimizing the federal collection information burden with particular emphasis on those individuals and entities most adversely affected. In addition, through our review of regulations, OIRA can help agencies identify places where regulatory changes can remove unnecessary administrative burdens. This past summer, we highlighted exciting work being done across the administration to save time and make it easier for people to access programs and services. Efforts like improving access to unemployment benefits, streamlining applications for farm loans, and improving recertification for individuals receiving Social Security disability benefits. All told, the initiatives discussed in the report will affect millions of individuals, families, and small businesses, including 18 million students and parents completing financial aid forms, hundreds of thousands of disabled beneficiaries, some 26,000 farmers taking out direct loans from the federal government annually, and over 25,000 veteran-owned small businesses. In this upcoming year, we're looking to build on these efforts and identify and reduce even more administrative burdens. But to do so effectively, we need to hear from the public. Individuals directly impacted by these administrative burdens who are filling out the forms themselves or helping friends and families do so are in the best position to point out where the process isn't working, where questions may be confusing or documentation requests burdensome. These perspectives are critical to agencies because if they don't know where the problems are, they can't fix them. There are multiple avenues for people to identify burdens from agency processes. As part of public comment on agency rules, it can be helpful to point out where processes can be improved. In addition, OIRA reviews all government forms on a regular basis. This is something I think folks don't pay as much attention to. And as part of that process, we get public or agencies seek public comment on those forms. In most cases, we get virtually no comments in a form, meaning agencies aren't hearing from those most impacted. So we encourage members of the public to visit OIRA's website to see forms we are currently reviewing and that are open for comments. Your comments can make a real difference by helping us to understand the barriers or burdens you might face or someone you help might face in completing a form. We also recognize that while these options are important, more proactive engagement is needed to reach impacted people, particularly those from underserved communities whose voices have too frequently been ignored. That's why we're working with agencies to expand opportunities for public participation. Over the summer, we put out guidance encouraging agencies 
to adopt leading practices for public participation and community engagement. Things like holding regular public listening sessions, using a variety of channels to share information with the public, and building on relationships that local, regional, or district agency offices might have with trusted community organizations working with folks on the ground. So I would encourage you to reach out to your agencies and to us at OIRA with great ideas for burden reduction. And I encourage you to review our recent guidance on expanding public participation and use it as a starting point for discussions with agencies about engagement opportunities that you'd like to see in the future. With that, uh, I'm really excited to turn this over uh, to Lily Roberts, uh, not only because it means that I actually was able to join in talk, um, but also because it means we're going to get to hear from this fantastic panel uh, that I know not only will you all get a chance to learn a lot from, but uh, I and my colleagues have already been and will continue to be learning from. So thanks so much again for this opportunity, uh, Lily and Kevin, and really looking forward to hearing from our wonderful panelists. Thanks, Sam. I'm um, so thrilled that you were able to join us. We'll hear again from Sam at the end of today's event um, to offer just a couple of closing thoughts. I've already introduced our wonderful panel, um, and I'm going to give them another opportunity to sort of introduce their work here. So, you know, as Sam mentioned, OIRA is thinking expansively about burden. It includes things like form design, but going beyond form design as well to think about service delivery more broadly. By way of introduction to your work, I'm hoping that each of you um, can share an example of a service delivery problem that you care about that when you looked at it from an administrative burden perspective, yielded a surprising insight or solution. Um, we're going to start, I think, with Dr. Barnes and then go to Michelle and close with Administrator Long. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> As Lily mentioned, I um, I do uh, uh, qualitative work on assistance programs that target uh, young families, so families with kids, um, with school-age kids and kids that are under the age of five, and that involves um, examining people's experiences with programs like WIC um, and SNAP and Medicaid and the intersection of those experiences. Um, I started a WIC study um, in 2015, and it involved interviewing workers and beneficiaries or applicants that were trying to get on the program. And one of the, I guess, surprising um, findings from that research was that, it, you know, folks really enjoyed their interactions with WIC staff, and they viewed the application process, some of it being clunky, but but by and large, um, they had very positive interactions, positive supportive interactions with WIC staff members, but they had a really difficult time using the benefits in the store. Um, and that sort of raised a set of questions about what it's like for people who once they've applied for public benefits, um, especially in sort of voucher-based programs where you have eligibility happening in one component of the experience, but you also have to take that voucher, you have to take that benefit and use it with a third party, like a retailer in WIC, or in the case of the child care subsidy, a child care provider, or housing, you have to find a landlord once you've been approved for Section 8 housing. Um, what's that process like? So we're, um, we tend to focus as scholars on, you know, what's happening within agencies and, and what makes a quality interaction in agencies, but what happens outside of those agencies? What happens when people are really trying um, their best to use the benefits once they've gotten through the hurdles of some of those initial costs that Sam mentioned? So that was a surprise. Um, and it's also a surprise, and then, I, and then I'll, um, I'll shut my mouth. <laughs> it's also a surprise at um, how different these programs are and experientially for people. So uh, folks, you know, they weigh and compare and contrast their experiences across these three programs. They, you know, people have really good experiences with WIC and their staff, um, but they don't have great experiences in SNAP for various reasons. And I've been thinking through uh, what those reasons are and how we can support um, um, eligibility workers across all three programs to provide high quality experiences for folks. So for me, um, what, one of the most uh, surprising things that I found out about unemployment insurance uh, prior to the pandemic was, you know, states had been modernizing their technology without doing any user testing. Um, <clears throat> and so, for example, things were really um, unnecessarily burdensome. For example, if you wanted to change your password um, or, or you lost your password uh, for the system, uh, in most unemployment insurance systems, you actually had to call a human being talk to them, and then that person would put a password in the U.S. mail that would get to your house in a couple of days. Um, so, so, you know, 
that was an unworkable model in 2020 when all of a sudden we went from 211,000 initial claims the first week of March to 6.6 million initial claims at the end of March. Um, by way of comparison, historically, the highest week that we had on record of initial claims prior to the pandemic was 695,000 in October of 1982. Um, so all of a sudden, states having to process all of these claims with a burdensome process just wasn't working for them. So, you know, it was pretty easy to get states on board with simplifying their claims, simplifying their communications, um, improving their processes, uh, just because we 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 came from a place that was that was so difficult. And I will tell you, you know, in the administration, when I was working in the administration on this issue, you know, we put in place a lot of process improvements. But, you know, the number one thing that I would recommend um, to uh, you know, make sure that you're putting in improvements that actually work is number one, talk to the claimants and number two, talk to the frontline workers. And the best way to get information about the claimant experience in, in, in um, our experience was working with legal aid uh, providers, because they were the ones that were helping people with extreme difficulties getting through the system. Um, and we set up like regular meetings with legal aid. Um, and, and we talked regularly with unions that represented the, the workers in the front lines. And that's just a cheat code to finding out where the where the access issues are. So I'll leave it there and pass it on to Administrator Long. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm uh, the administrator of the Food Nutrition Service, which operates uh, all of the domestic nutrition assistance programs, including WIC. So Dr. Barnes, I'm very uh, excited to hear a little bit more about your work. We should connect after this. Uh, I wanted to just uh, talk briefly about uh, a burden issue related to the school meals programs. You know, as you may remember, these programs have been around for a long time and uh, it's always been the case that lower income kids can get meals uh, for at a free or at reduced price. And determining who was eligible for those was traditionally done via application, uh, which were collected at the school level. And that has long was long considered to be highly burdensome, both for families and for schools. Schools would often cite it as the number one paperwork burden that they faced. Um, but back in 2010, legislation uh, provided us with an alternative called community eligibility. And I won't get into all the details, but it's a it's a simplified approach to uh, determining how schools uh, can be reimbursed by the federal government without applications, and it allows them uh, all to serve all of their meals at no costs to students. So they don't have to require individual families to submit applications for free and reduced price meals. And again, their federal funding is based on a formula that uses existing data, primarily information on the SNAP participation of the students in the schools. And so again, they, this, is, this is something that is available to lower income communities. Um, we certainly saw what was expected from this change uh, because it was expected to reduce paperwork and burden and to increase access. And so, yes, indeed, schools and families experienced uh, a reduction in burden. And we did, in fact, see an increase in access in the form of increased participation in CEP schools. There were a couple of things that were surprising. Uh, you know, we've had this in place now for a little more than a decade, and we've, we've really learned that the benefits of this approach have gone far beyond providing expanded access and paperwork reduction, as important as those are. They included improving the school nutrition experience in ways like reducing stigma, reducing family stress, and improving the nutritional quality of the programs. And I think we'll have a chance to talk a little more about that later. The second thing that I would flag is that the take up of this uh, burden reduction approach was far beyond what anyone would have imagined. Um, I'm slightly embarrassed to say this, but I will. When we when we did the final rule to implement this uh, new provision, we estimated that about 500 school districts across the country would take advantage of it. Last school year, over 6,400 districts, districts including 40,000 schools across the country are currently participating in the program. So that was the second big surprise. And I'll, I'll stop there. That's actually a great segue to, to another question. You know, I think that one thing, so you alluded, Administrator Long, to the 
um, importance of not just getting food to children, but also sort of all of these other effects that happen for the schools as well. Um, and so we often think about administrative burden in the context of that individual take up, but I'd like to take each of you sort of beyond that framing. Um, even though it's obviously incredibly important and sort of what drives much much of the change here. So one impact that um, I'd love to hear Michelle talk a little bit about is sort of what this means for a thriving economy overall. Can you walk us through what unemployment insurance and the administrative burdens to accessing it or the lack thereof does for the strength of the wider economy, particularly in periods like 2020 and 2021? Right. So in 2020, we saw an extraordinarily V-shaped recovery, right? We saw that one of the fastest economic recoveries in history. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that um, unemployment insurance was available to people, but also Congress took the step to expand unemployment insurance in three ways. Um, it expanded access to benefits through the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. It expanded the amount of income replaced by unemployment insurance with the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, and it extended the duration of benefits with Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation. And um, as a result, you know, far more people were able to access benefits than, than would have without those, those programs. But I want to underscore that that did not work perfectly, that a lot of claimants experienced extreme difficulty accessing benefits in, in, in early 2020. And it took, you know, some people months to get, to get into the benefits. And then, you know, in subsequent months, you know, fraud rings found their way into uh, the system. And so for that reason, you know, we really need to spend some time figuring out how to streamline benefits so that the people who are eligible have an easy time getting them and the people who aren't eligible are effectively locked out. Um, and so, so um, yeah, I, th I think that what's really important is to understand that unemployment insurance is a macroeconomic stabilizer, which, you know, spurs spending in the local economy. You know, in 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 fall of 2020, I went to go buy a new lawnmower. Um, and 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 I went down to the local hardware store. And the owner of the hardware store said, Hey, I haven't seen you in here in a while. What's been going on? I said, Well, I work on unemployment insurance. And so it's been busy. And he said, you know, I'm supposed to not like this $600 extra benefit. Uh, but for me, what it meant was that people were home, they were looking at their walls, they were looking at their lawns, and they came in and bought stuff from me. And it helped me out. And, and we were able to you know, stay open and stay thriving through the pandemic. Um, so, you know, it, it's it, for every dollar spent in unemployment insurance, nearly two dollars is generated in local economic activity. And, and that's a you know really important factor to keep in mind. Thanks. Now, Administrator Long, you alluded to sort of what what reducing administrative burden can do for building an inclusive social fabric. So increasing an individual's access to food is obviously incredibly important. But talk to us a little bit what it means to focus on an entire school gaining access to school meals. What exactly happens to stigma, to educational outcomes and to the whole school community? Yeah, well, you know, we had um, we had an extraordinary uh natural experiment, if you will, uh, with, with exactly that uh, during the pandemic, uh, because not because of the, the particular program I was talking about before, but because Congress gave us the flexibility uh, to waive the applications and to allow schools to serve all meals at no cost to students uh, for that entire period. So based on both that and the study of uh, the community eligibility provision, we, we, have, seen, we have seen significant benefits. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, it's reduced paperwork and increased access. Uh, we saw that it reduced stigma. Uh, we, you know, when all kids are able to obtain meals, there's no categorization of the kids that eat this cafeteria meals uh, for free and those that don't. Um, there is also research on these what are called these what are called universal programs that have found that we see better academic outcomes, including higher attendance rate and fewer disciplinary concerns. Uh, so there's a real impact on the overall school community and, and experience. We also see benefits that are specific to the school nutrition program. When you have this kind of approach, no applications, no charge, schools are able to focus their efforts on improving the nutritional quality and the appeal of meals instead of dealing with paperwork. Uh, the other thing that has been what we learned is that this, there's a certain financial stability that's provided with this kind of approach. Schools have a higher participation level in general, and it's more stable. Uh, so it typically means that they have a higher and more stable level of funding. So they can do things like invest in uh, newer equipment uh, and 
you know, make long-term investments around things like training uh, for staff and, you know, invest in, in, in allowing them to do things like more scratch cooking. We also, another really important effect that we, we saw was that um, it really did help families financially. I mean, we, we heard anecdotally over and over uh, what a relief it was for families who were particularly sort of in the range just above the eligibility standards, uh, what, how, how wonderful it was not to have to worry about uh, paying for school lunch. Because if your child, if you have say two kids eating uh, school lunch and breakfast every day, that's about $80, $90 a week. Uh, and so again, it, it gives them dollars in their pocket they can spend on something else, which was particularly important uh, because some of the uh, price increases that we saw uh, after the pandemic. Um, so again, I, I mentioned this as a surprise earlier, but it's it's really um, it's really an example. Let me, oh, sorry, the last thing I wanna say about that is I think that the, the evidence for the benefits of this approach um, can be seen by the fact that we have, I think it's nine or 10 states that uh, have adopted and decided to fund this approach themselves, even though uh, the federal government's not there yet. And I think that is for the reasons I've described, uh, the, those states and the families and parents in those states uh, saw that it was worth it uh, and they've supported continuation of, of this approach. That's really exciting to hear about state action. Thank you so much. Um, and the final category I wanna sort of hear about this afternoon or this morning is um, sort of the, the effects for a vibrant and inclusive democracy. So Dr. Barnes, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the newer research you're working on, um, on how implementation of policy um, reproduces racial inequality in rural Southern communities? What are opportunities for using the tools that we're discussing here um, that are sort of specific to rural areas and specific to um, addressing long baked in racial inequality? Well, that's a very big question. <laughs> I'm trained as a political scientist, and I guess uh, within that sphere, I'm considered a policy feedback scholar. So I study how the designs of uh, public programs teach people lessons about government and can politically mobilize or demobilize them. And typically in that space, um, researchers tend to um, say that targeted means-tested programs like SNAP and Medicaid um, would demobilize people or teach negative lessons about uh, the government. You know, a negative interaction with a caseworker might convey the message that the government doesn't care about people like me or someone like me or my family or my community. A complicated form might convey the same kind of message. Um, so I've been trying to figure out what features of program design or policy design can be politically empowering. Um, and, and that usually involves having you know, really supportive interactions with workers. Like if you can figure out a way to incentivize supportive, um, uh, caring, helpful interactions between um, workers and claimants, applicants, beneficiaries, that that can have long-term implications for democracy. Um, in terms of uh, policy implementation in rural Southern communities, we don't really know a lot. So, so a part of this, this new bigger project is understanding what happens in the rural South. Um, a lot of, from the academic research, a lot of the, a lot of the research has tend to focus on large urban centers in the North and in the Midwest. When we think about what it's like to apply for benefits, or we think about how agencies are working on the ground, but it's different in rural communities. Like you might actually know your caseworker. You might have gone to high school with your caseworker. Um, your caseworker could be your cousin, you know, or your neighbor. Uh, there's a different sort of social fabric and um, different weight placed on social ties in rural communities that might shape in good ways and in bad ways, uh, the nature of your interactions with the state. And then also um, to, to earlier points about assistance programs being integral to local economies, that is especially the case in rural communities that have experienced economic decline in the last 30 years. So um, your county DSS office might be the largest employer now in lieu of that manufacturing job or that plant that employed half the county 20 years ago. Um, and understanding what that means um, in terms of the quality of the workforce, who ends up in those agencies, um, how does that um, replicate um, patterns of exclusion? Is, is you know, being a, a, a welfare bureaucrat a, a sign of status now? And does that, it, the, does that shape how you engage folks that are seeking assistance. So answering those kinds of questions and thinking through, 
are um, citizen state interactions um, distinct in uh, rural communities? And my focus is in the South because I'm from the South um, and we don't know a lot about the South, but it, are, those, are those interactions distinct in ways that have consequences for democracy? Thank you. I feel like I can't wait to do the panel. That's just an hour of you talking about what you're going to learn from that work. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to go to a couple of sort of maybe rapid fire questions because we're getting a bunch of questions in the Q&A. And so I want to make sure we have enough time for everything, but there's a lot to cover in each of your um, each of your portfolios. So I'm wondering if anyone wants to jump in with an answer to this question. All of you have worked on the challenge of not just accessing a benefit or program for which someone is eligible, but the challenge of maintaining that benefit. Um, sometimes that's not as discussed. Sometimes we're more focused on um, sort of the work that it takes to reduce burdens on the person signing up for the first time. Can each of, can is one of you uh, sort of chopping at the bit to discuss how maintenance or recertification or loss shows up in your work? I can start unless someone else has a preference. <laughs> Cindy, did you want to go? Please go um, ahead. Um, so uh, accessing benefits long-term implies that you have a pretty stable life, um, that your household doesn't change much, um, that your job doesn't change much, and that your address doesn't change much, and that your phone number doesn't change much or any form of contact information that's on file um, with your initial case. And, and those are those are big asks for folks that are living in precarity, especially in the last few years. Granted, the federal government, um, through policy waivers, did make programs more accessible, elim um, eliminated recertification requirements or deadlines, uh, eliminating or, or extending, I should say, the recertification deadlines, moving to remote access of workers, calling in, uh, emailing in, texting in, as, as opposed to having to go in person for a lot of things. So there were efforts to make things more accessible, but it's still really difficult. And it's challenging on the workers end too, because if the person that signed up for, or the, the household that signed up for SNAP or Medicaid, say, in at, at time point one, six months later for the research, their lives have changed. Their household looks different. They're supposed to report new information. They didn't because it's hard to get a hold of them. The worker has to request all this new information over and over and over again, and they're sending it to the wrong address. So, so there's the churn issue, right? So a lot of, I guess my point being the way, the way in which we sort of think about maintenance over time and how we've designed these programs to intersect with people's lives over time doesn't really reflect the reality of, of families that are dealing with economic hardship and precarity. And we have to figure out ways to design programs that are a little more flexible so that people don't lose benefits on the count of, you know, inflation, economic <laughs> decline, job loss, changes in family structure. Um, so, so I think it's difficult for folks to keep, to stay on, on benefits. Now, I can jump in if, if you like, Lily. So I sort of have two structural observations uh, about the work we did in school meals on that issue. One is that we, we had this wonderful opportunity to move the eligibility consideration from the family and individual to the institution, a school. So it, you know, and, and that that was beneficial both upfront and for maintaining benefits because the schools uh, in this particular instance, they had eligibility for actually several years. Uh, but then when it was time to sort of reassess, that burden didn't fall on every family in the school. It was it was at the school administration level. Now I realize that we don't necessarily have that ability in all programs, but I, I do think it's that this notion of shifting eligibility off individual families towards institutions that are more able to manage it is, is something that ought to be really thought about a little more. And the second thing I would point out is that this uh, this particular approach rely instead of relying on individuals to provide eligibility data for this particular program, we relied on the processes that they had already used for other programs, primarily SNAP. Uh, so, you know, again, and this is something you, you hear over and over and over and again from recipients is like, why do I have to apply for all of these different programs that have very similar criteria over and over again. So this was an example of a place we were able to take advantage of, of that existing data and again, remove some of that burden from families. 
Thank you. Michelle, I'm wondering if I can come to you for a, for a slightly different question, but I think one that's very related. You've talked a little bit about um, getting sort of user perspective um, on, on a system. How do you learn from the millions of stakeholders in the unemployment insurance system to find out what their experiences and challenges mean for designing a better system? Yeah, and, and um, I, I see a question in the chat here on, uh, uh, to that point from uh, Jennifer Phillips at, in, in Illinois, and I want to just um, call out Illinois as a state that's being very uh, proactive in making sure that people have better access. So, you know, thank you so much for, for your work for, for claimants um, there. I think two, two things. Number one, um, you can get access to users through... Um, through your through through legal aid claimants through you know reaching out to claimants, <clears throat> I would also say you know use your frontline staff as much as you can. They know where people are frustrated. They're they're getting those calls. They're getting those frustrated, angry calls about you know I don't understand how to answer this question. I'm getting held up. This this doesn't make any sense to me. Those frontline staff really do um, have access to the answers. And then with regard to user testing. Um, you know, one thing that we found uh, works great, and I, I know that Illinois is actually doing a lot of user testing right now, um, and it, it, that's excellent. And so, so you know the answer to this as well as I do, which is um, iter iterative processes work best. So you get a few users in, you improve the form, and then you bring in more users and improve the form based on that. And it, it's kind of, it's it's a long, difficult process and it involves, you know, buy-in uh, up and down uh, the agency. Um, so I, I recently did a deep dive with New Jersey, which is another state that's doing a great job uh, at incorporating um, user feedback in their technology improvements. And, um, you know, one thing that we found there is, right, in order to do the kind of robust process that needs to be done, you can't just tell the UI agency to fix the problem. It's going to be, a, you know, there's got to be buy-in all the way up to the executive, right? And there's got to be buy-in all the way down to the, you know, frontline workers. It's it's really something that is very time-consuming, and you have to just admit that. Admit that and, and understand that, um, you know, Everybody in the process is going to have to spend some time in these meetings because what what you see happening is a technologist will come in and say, "Hey, you know, we could really improve the process by taking out steps nine, eleven, and fifteen. But you'll have a subject matter expert, maybe at the agency, who's reluctant to do that because, well, you know, maybe those steps are actually legally required. You need somebody to come in and." Um, Come in and say no, no. Actually, we 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 really did a deep dive on the, you know, requirements of the the, the law and found that those those steps are actually they, they really are unnecessary. So you, you know, you just need you need buy in from everybody and you need somebody to push and say, even if this is time consuming, we're going to keep doing it. That's really helpful, and I'm actually going to use that as a sort of a transition to blur the lines here between the audience Q and A and my own my questions here for this group because I saw a question in the chat um about um someone who was interested in hearing about how to balance the level of proof of eligibility documentation or or certification of some kind versus the eligibility uh versus the sort of the potential for enrolling people who aren't truly eligible and i think that's a concern in the ui space i know that you sort of alluded to the to the fraud rings um michelle how do you think about that tension within the ui system specifically Right. This is one of the hardest questions that we have to deal with. Um, you know, a lot of a, a lot of states, a lot of um, you know, folks tend to lean toward in order to prevent fraud, let's put as much gate, you know, gatekeeping up front as possible. And, you know, what we found prior to the pandemic is, you know, all of the hurdles that that we put in place to try and prevent fraud actually increased erroneous denials by twice as much, right? So, so you know, you have to be really careful there. Um, recent guidance that's come out from the Department of Labor is excellent to point to that says, you know, you don't necessarily have to put a visible gate to claimants up front, but you need some kind of uh, gate. And, and so, you know, with unemployment insurance, you can put in uh, technology that will flag people, um, because they're 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 signing in from a strange device or a strange location, um, and then you can put people through 
more more stringent identity verification, but it doesn't necessarily have have to apply to everyone, and it cannot be the first thing that people go through that makes a determination of eligibility um, without an actual person from the state agency um, making a determination. Um, so yeah, yeah, you have to be really careful in how you're trying to uh, you know catch people doing wrong things while still you know another thing about unemployment insurance right is the timely payment of benefits is in the Social Security Act. So people are supposed to get their benefits within two or three weeks. There's a there's a balance you have to strike there um, in making sure that benefits go out quickly, but that also, you know, you prevent benefits from going to the wrong people. So it it's an ongoing challenge. Um, I do not envy state agencies having to figure this out, but there there is a balance out there. Thank you. And I'll remind folks to please use the Q&A um, it, there's a little button at the bottom of your Zoom screen that says Q&A, um, and I will be fielding those questions. I'm going to ask one last sort of uh, moderator's privileged question um, that's been on my mind during this conversation, and then we'll we'll add some more um, audience Q&A to the mix. Um, so this is actually a question for um, Dr. Barnes. It's a little bit more um, academic in nature, but I, I think your work um, sort of speaking with, with people and doing um, the, the research on the ground is really helpful to think about this. So as, as, as administrative burden takes hold as a concept, some policymakers default to language around cutting red tape. Um, we've called today's event the time tax. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you think about these metaphors um, within the issues you work on? Is there other language that you use that helps sort of explain the challenges you tackle to a wider audience? Mm. Oh dear. Um, so so um, I would say I rely on the administrative burden framework in part because the folks that developed it um, developed it in response to this question. Like people are calling this a bunch of different things um, uh, in a bunch of different fields and practitioners have a different understanding of what this means. So let's provide an organizing framework around um, what what barriers to access might look like. So I guess on the ground with um, workers and beneficiaries, I obviously focus on you know, what keeps you from uh, engaging this program, what keeps you from applying. If they fall off the program, what was the barrier to, um, to continued program use? So that's how I tend to, to think about it. Um, workers are thinking about pressure. They're not. <laughs> they're thinking about what they're were what they're responsible for. Um, they're thinking about um, what the federal government allows them to do, what their supervisor will allow them to do under the purview of the federal government. Um, they are hyper aware of federal and state oversight in how they um, how they intake applications, how they process applications, the consequences of error rates, the consequences of being. Um, slow, like if your average processing time for a case doesn't meet federal statute, you could, you know, go under corrective action as an agency, as a county, as a state. So there's a preoccupation with these federal uh, performance um, measures or benchmarks that can get in the way of being focused on increasing access. So it's kind of similar to, to uh, Michelle's point about um, fraud, right? Like the trade-off between fraud and access and trying to figure out um, how, how to deliver services to people who are eligible. I think there's this tension happening in agencies with frontline workers on the trade-off between expanding access, but also meeting federal guidelines for performance. Because um, if you focus on trying to be efficient, that means that you might end up not responding to that call from the person who would be eligible, right? It means that you might not... Um, uh, spend as much time on cases um, that maybe need additional SNAP benefits that you're not accounting for. It means that, you know, it shapes the way that you're engaging the systems that um, and the interfaces that you're using to process applications. You might take shortcuts um, to, to make these benchmarks that in the end create more burdens for applicants. Administrator Long, one, one question for you. Um, as seen by the questions that we're getting today and, and the 
um, people who have joined us. You are speaking to one of the wonkier audiences that could possibly be assembled um, on, a on a topic. Um, so I'm going to get a little meta with this question. Um, as FNS administrator, there is a bureaucracy that you need to work within to reduce the administrative burden for those that you serve. What are some lessons that you can share um, about changing policy design and implementation within the governmental context? I think we've got some state um, government officials and folks who are advocates um, to sort of be changing large systems. I think they'd love to hear about sort of the work that you do within the within a um, federal context, particularly. Yeah, um, well, that's a great question. And I, I could probably talk at length, uh, as, as could others, about the, the complexities at the federal level of simply decision making and getting things like regulations out. But what I actually think is, is the more relevant point um, that I'd like to make is that Many federal programs, including school meals, we consider them federal programs, but they op actually operate through this fairly complicated system involving the feds, the states, and local entities, right? And one of the lessons I, I think we've learned that is that policymakers at the federal level really need to understand this and consider the context and challenges at all of the levels of, of program execution. And we really don't have structures either in the legislative process or the administrative rulemaking process to encourage and facilitate that. And a result, as a result, I think that too often, both Congress and the executive branch decision makers don't pay enough attention to the perspective of other players, which often have to do with sort of operational kind of challenges. So just as a, as a really quick example, uh, in, in doing this work with Universal Free and the community eligibility piece, um, one of the side effects, uh, if you will, of not doing school meal applications anymore is that schools no longer have individual uh, socioeconomic information on, on their school population. The school lunch application was the source of that forever. And it has been used historically to allocate other federal funds as well as state and local funds. And we knew that, but we did not recognize the, the massive implications that uh, that loss of that data would, would uh, engender. Uh, and so it took years of working hard with our federal partners to identify alternative approaches for federal programs. Uh, and we got there, but it took time. And it, it, frankly, it took even longer for state and local entities to work through those kinds of, of challenges. Uh, and it's something that prevented uh, lots of school districts who would have otherwise benefited significantly from the universal approach to taking it up in some cases for years. So I don't know that it could have been avoided, but I do think it could have been mitigated better. Again, if we had better processes for engaging the entire operating structure at all three levels up front. Thank I you. agree. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> a resound resounding agreement. Um, I, I want to um, ask another question here that I thought was particularly interesting. So um, one group that's particularly burdened by the time tax is disabled people. Um, all sorts of programs um, that disabled people interact with um, sort of require extra extra forms, extra certification, engagement with doctors, um, all sorts of additional layers of, of burden. So can anyone here describe how um, bringing a disability justice lens to your work has sort of helped you think about bringing all people um, access to a service or program? So um, I, I am somebody who worked for Senator Harkin for 10 years. So, uh, you know, you, you don't work for the author of the ADA for that long without bringing a disability lens into everything you do. Um, one thing I find, uh, you know, challenging in the unemployment insurance world is that one of the requirements for unemployment insurance is that you be able, available and actively seeking work per the Social Security Act. Um, a lot of a, a lot of folks take that able and available a little bit far. Um, both in terms of their interpretation of the law and also in their accessibility, um, you know, to, to forms and online. Um, one one of the efforts that, that the Department of Labor is engaged in is um, sending tiger teams to states. Um, so these are teams of experts that go in and look at state um, state systems and find out if, you know, how you can improve access, timeliness and fight fraud all at the same time. Um, and one thing that they they found in, in several states uh, is, is, you know, just states not following WCAG guidelines um, in their forms. And I, I just think, I think that we need to be thinking about, you know, people with disabilities can work. People with disabilities um, 
you know, should be able to have access to the unemployment insurance system because, you know, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities has always been extremely high. And the unemployment insurance system is designed to keep people attached to the workforce. So it's critical that we make sure that that forms are accessible and that we're interpreting able and available in a fair way. Um, and, you know, I, I have lots more to say about that, but I'll pass it off to my colleagues. I may take a, that opportunity to ask an additional question. I'm seeing um, a theme in our audience Q&A, um, I think from some state-focused folks. We've got um, someone who is with ASME. We've got someone who it looks like might be working for the state of Vermont. Um, there's some interest here in sort of staff capacity and state capacity and, and what the federal government can do to support states, particularly states that might be smaller or, or budget constrained. So there's, you know, obviously, um, folks who are working hard to reduce administrative burden by modernizing technology and integrating eligibility applications, but the cost of doing that um, is, is burdensome to states um, that are smaller or budget constrained. Um, and oftentimes the budget, uh, the burden um, in this case falls on um, experienced and sort of uh, expert state staff. Um, can anyone talk a little bit about the support at the federal level that's available um, to improve systems and, and ways that state workers or state thinkers um, might get engaged with these federal efforts? That might also be a question for Sam when he comes back on. I think money is important. Um, yeah. So, so we think uh, when we think about uh, in the, the social policy world, the implications of federalism, on the kind of welfare state people are experiencing. So Jamila Mishra has great work on variation in uh, Medicaid generosity and the suite of services that you have um, access to depending on where you live in the United States. And a lot of that has to do with this, you know, federal and state partnership on delivering um, benefits. But what we don't think about is the fact that there are cost sharing agreements and all these federal programs where the federal government agrees to pay a share of uh, the cost of delivering benefits, the administrative budget of these programs. So states, and in some cases, counties, depending on which state you live in, they have to pick up the, the other half of that budget. And that's hard. If we see variation in the generosity and accessibility of benefits across states, with a lot of like Southern um, high poverty states or high poverty states in general offering less to folks, what do you think that's gonna look like when we think about administration? <laughs> It means that those those agencies are also going to be understaffed because you got to raise taxes to raise uh, revenue to to pay for the delivery of these programs. So so I think money matters and those cost sharing agreements matter. And I don't think we think about that enough. Uh, a part of this um, isn't necessarily about the forms per se, because a lot of people say, um, yeah, I got the form, but I want someone to walk me through how to apply for the benefit, how, walk me through what these what these questions mean, right? So you can simplify the form and you can do all kinds of things with technology to make things easier to access, but a lot of people just want a good worker. And what does it mean if you can't get a good worker because the state or the county can't raise the revenue to, to hire another worker, you know? And this was especially the case during the pandemic when folks' caseloads for applications increased 30 to 40%. You were already strained last year with last year's SNAP applications or last year's Medicaid applications, and there's no additional federal dollars to help you hire more people, right? So, so I think the way that we fund administration could shift, especially during times of crisis, to expand like administrative capacity, bureaucratic capacity on the ground, get more workers in buildings, and I bet we'll see a reduction of burden. I think you also need to see a sustained commitment to funding. Um, so going into the pandemic in unemployment insurance, we were at a 50 year low in real dollars funding. Um, and and um, that has a tremendous impact on the ability of systems to scale up. So, you know, for the last couple of years, Congress has passed, uh, you know, increased funding for administration for unemployment insurance, but then the debt ceiling happened and Congress took away a billion of the $2 billion that were allocated to improve systems um, because, you know, unemployment is low now. So we, you know, shouldn't fix the roof when the sun is shining. Like that makes no sense to me. Um, we, we need to care about these systems even when there's not a crisis.
Administrator Long, is there anything you want to uh, add about working with states to build capacity from the federal perspective? Well, I guess the only thing I, I might add is that um, it does, it's, I mean, some of what uh, you were both talking about is, is very sort of similar to the experience we had with InSNAP, uh, which is also 50-50 funded. I, I actually do think there is a, a role for increasing awareness uh, of the fact that states do fund some of the administration of this program. Um, I certainly understand the point that in some cases they are they are indeed constrained. But on the other hand, there is also examples of uh, significant amounts of the pandemic funds at the state level being used to do things like uh, tax reductions. Uh, so I, I think it is sometimes a little bit more complicated. And, and again, I would um, I wonder how many folks are aware that choices made in their state legislators actually impact in a very profound way the execution of federal programs. Thank you so much to our panelists. This has been an incredibly robust discussion. There are, I am furiously writing down the incredible questions that we've gotten that we don't have time to get to today. Um, really interesting political questions about whether expanding eligibility um, can help build political will to support a program, um, in the, particular in the case of school meals, um, whether there are um, advantages or disadvantages to using things like the tax code itself um, to sort of streamline the ways that the federal government um, gets access to information and, and provides uh, financial support. Um, I, I wish we could have gotten every question, but I'm going to turn things back over to Sam Berger for, for some closing thoughts. Um, and again, thank you so much to our panelists for joining us today. Thanks. Um, I mean, this is just a, a fantastic discussion. And I think um, one takeaway from this is that there's a lot more to be done in this space, right? So for folks that are maybe at a, a nonprofit or academic researchers, there's a lot more research to be done to find other uh, aspects of burden reduction, to work through some of the intricacies. There's a lot of exciting work that's already ongoing. There's a lot of exciting work that's going to be happening. I think for folks that are organizers, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of trying to bridge that gap between the folks that are experiencing uh, these impacts and the decision makers. And there's a lot of interest on the federal side to hear from those folks. So uh, really encourage people to, to think through that. And obviously on, on our side, we're continuing to look at uh, ways that we can reduce these burdens. And a lot of that uh, feedback, the feedback from you all, the research from outside academics and nonprofits, uh, the feedback um, from individuals experiencing on the ground, from helping folks, uh, from community organizations, both about the, the, the burns that need to reduce themselves and the ways in which we can better collect and, and hear this information from folks is all critical. So we're really excited about the work that's already gone on to date, but even more excited about the work that's going to be uh, forthcoming. So really appreciate uh, the wonderful uh, panelists for talking through all of these important issues for everyone who joined, spent this, this hour with us, and for the Center for American Progress for hosting this really important event and looking forward to continued conversation with all of you. Uh, so thanks so much to everyone for, for participating. Just a, a wonderful and, and really important issue. Glad we had a chance to, to spend an hour to get a discussion.